Coming up on Profiles in Caring, presented by Equitable Life and Casualty. Using state-of-the-art computer technology to open up the world to a population of people trapped inside their bodies. It's Eagle Eyes, and it's next. The following Profiles in Caring is made possible through generous support from Equitable Life and Casualty, committed to caring. Welcome to this edition of Profiles in Caring. I'm Kimberly Perkins. If you're watching me now, you probably give little thought to how you communicate. You see, you hear, you understand, you respond. But not everybody is born with these gifts. For complicated and varied medical reasons, some people have no means of communication except with their eyes. We found a nonprofit trying to help this challenged group with a technology called Eagle Eyes. And to understand just how important this technology is, you need to understand how dark their world can be. Something wasn't right with my daughter. He would almost be, be considered no brain fun like function. In about two and a half we found out that she had the mental capacity of between like a six and nine months old. At first they thought he had cerebral palsy um, but that wasn't the case and he has an undiagnosed neurological disorder. Most of them are nonverbal. They cannot use their hands so they have no motor skills at all. Many of them are very spastic. Because they don't speak, because they cannot use their hands cognitively, we have no idea where they are. It took about 13 months to finally get a diagnosis of what was wrong. She has a seizure disorder, and so she has multiple seizures throughout the week, sometimes even during the day. His brain doesn't really communicate with his body, but they're not really sure why. Um, every, every ounce of his body, like every single functional part, his nerves, his muscles, everything is perfect. His eyes are perfect, his ears are perfect, but yet he doesn't see and he doesn't hear and he doesn't, you know, because his brain doesn't really process any of the information or send any stimulus to his body to tell it to work. It is like having a baby where you're guessing why they're crying or, you know, just assuming that they're smiling at you because you did something funny. You make assumptions and sometimes that's what you have to do. Happy and sad is all we have right now. And that's why we're here searching. That's, that's the hardest thing in my life is to try to find a way of, does your nose itch? Are you hungry? Are, you, are your toes cold? You know, what? that's the hardest thing we have. And that's when another reason that we're searching out for these options. For right now, all we have is him kind of giving us a smile and kind of giving us a cry, which he used to, two years ago, he could not do either of those things. There's children out there that are locked into their bodies and can't express themselves in any way. Um, if we can give them the tools to even give us a yes, no, it just opens doors up like you wouldn't believe. I know Jake is inside here, and I know he's doing all he can to, to get out and to, and to tell us, and it's our job to find a way to, to let him out and to, to let us know what he's feeling, and that's our job, and I will keep searching until we find the right tools. We say they have special needs, and for those of us on the periphery, we slowly but surely begin to understand that not only do they have special needs, but they are truly special individuals with so much they want to give and to communicate. But for so many years and even generations, real and meaningful communication has been impossible. Meet Michael. You can barely see me, Mike Nash, but I'm in here. I used to feel that I lived in this darkness. You'll see, however, that I'm real. I really am. I am an energetic and fascinating man. When the school mornings come, I'm deep within my sleep and then my mom arrives to wake me up. I just want to be left alone to continue with my dreams. Give me one more hour is all I ask, and then I'll be conscious. All right, buddy. Mom helps me to get dressed. 
Sometimes it takes a long time. She's very particular about my clothes and that I am comfortable. Syndrome, thank you. My understanding is that the recommendations of Michael's doctors early in the process was that he be institutionalized, that um, it was likely he would be a burden on the family and that they should consider institutionalizing him. His mother would have no part of that, I believe, because uh, she knew there was something inside of Michael just waiting to get out. It is a hidden population. I think the general populace is a little fearful of people with severe disabilities. They don't know what to say, and so uh, they'll pull back and kind of maybe ignore, not meaning to be rude or inconsiderate, but just thinking, oh my gosh, I might say the wrong thing, so I'm not going to say anything, so I'll just walk on by. Also, especially with people with severe, severe disabilities, uh, we are talking about people who are oftentimes very spastic, sometimes they're drooling, and people don't know how to deal with that. So rather than just walking up and say, hi, I'm Debbie, how are you today? We choose to just turn and walk away. And I'm hoping that, you know, as this gets out in the forefront, it can maybe break down some of those barriers because, you know, we're really all much more alike than we are different. I want people to see that just because we're in a chair, just because we talk differently or we do things differently, does not mean that we can't communicate and that we can't crack a joke, understand, you know, really just live. And I want people to realize that we live just like they do, that nobody's different that people tend to, to talk about these children, not talk to them. Treat them as spectators rather than participants. And we learn very quickly that we want to treat Michael as a participant, not a spectator. We can rest assured that if Michael could talk, he would look us in the eye and say, treat me no different than you treat everyone else. And as you talk with parents of these special needs and most special children, they will tell you their goal is to make everything as normal for children like Michael as they do for all of their children. For Michael and his family and friends, there is school. There are activities like bowling and many other things. But that's not to say it isn't frustrating. Parents know there's someone inside desperately wanting to get out. And communication is really where we're stressing, you know, some effort in teaching them and teaching people around them to learn how to communicate. Learning how to communicate was exactly the focus of Boston College professors Peter Olivieri and Jim Gibbs. Reaching out to this incredibly special population, the two men committed themselves to providing an avenue for communication through an individual's eyesight. It's certainly impossible for any of us to know what it's like to not be able to communicate. Unless we've been there, we can't imagine what it's like to want to say something, to want to communicate something, and not be able to do that. It must, ha must be a tremendous sense of hopelessness of darkness, that you, you can't communicate a basic need or a feeling or a wish. One day in 1992, Peter Oliveri and I were having lunch and we were talking about what research project would you work on, um, if we could work on anything at all in the world. Um, we decided it would be a novel form of interacting with a computer where we would think something, the computer would understand our thoughts, the computer would think something, and we would understand what the computer was thinking. No typing, just direct control of the computer. When we come back, we're going to meet Professor Gibbs. We'll show you the technology and hear his personal story about why he's so passionate about eagle eyes. Do stay with us.